And thank you, Stu, for those uh, very kind words. Uh, Stuart is never wrong, um, but I don't remember being that fast a runner. Um, uh, but I, I'd also like to uh, stress that it's actually not that hard to take on these issues for a, uh, for a bank or uh, from the position that I hold at the bank. There's really not a whole lot of debate about where we need to go uh, or what we need to accomplish as a country and as an economy. How we get there is the subject of many vigorous debates, including the one we'll, uh, we'll have here today. Um, but let me start first by uh, you know, th thanking Stuart again for, uh, for putting this on and for inviting RBC to be part of this impressive group. And thank you, especially those of you who did make it through Washington or other points of transit for coming to Ottawa at what is truly a uh, beautiful time of year in this city. Um, but most importantly, I think you'll all uh, know just by being here that you've gra gathered at a critical time in our national discussion about climate change. Uh, this is the moment, uh, a moment that Canadians are, are coming to grips with what, whether Canada, as a major energy producer and consumer, as was mentioned earlier, can pull off what I call the hat trick of climate policy to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, to increase energy efficiency, and continue to build prosperity for our nation. There frankly may be no greater challenge before us as a country, and in an age of struggling economies and graying populations, no greater opportunity. Uh, you may want to call it a made in Canada opportunity that really is made for Canada. I'd like to start off by uh, also thanking Stuart for being among the first to see that challenge as an opportunity uh, to build a new kind of economy at the very moment that the old economy is, if you'll pardon the expression, running low on gas. Stuart's commitment to evidence-based policy and his diligence in forming Smart Prosperity, it, a group that we're proud to belong to, really is commendable. I've had the pleasure, as uh, Stu mentioned, of uh, knowing him for years, and there's no one I can think of who has as much commitment to the cause and its uh, underlying issues. Shortly after uh, joining RBC last year, after a career in journalism, I attended a meeting with uh, Stuart and several others in Calgary. Uh, it's hard to remember at the time, the NDP had just won power in Alberta and the federal election was in full swing. And no one really was quite sure where the country was, uh, was going, certainly pol politically. But in that heated political environment, Stuart managed to bring together a disparate range of people from the oil patch and environmental NGOs to food companies and a couple of us from finance. Sitting in the room, I was quite amazed that anyone could bring uh, so many different minds into uh, to one place for a, for a vigorous but uh, polite discussion to talk about fundamentally the need to build rational support for rational public policy. That's, that's what smart prosperity is. It's pro founded on the premise that choosing between a strong economy and a healthy planet is a false choice. We cannot have one without the other. We need both. So I instantly got a sense of that meeting in Calgary of the value that this approach could bring, the value of gathering different interests around a common cause, and came back to Toronto energized by this idea of smart prosperity. And with the endorsement of our CEO, Dave Mackay, we signed on as a member of uh, both the uh, initiative and its leadership council determined to help Canada achieve a lower carbon future without demanding a lower quality of life. And you may ask, as our CEO did publicly at the time, what would a bank see in a lower carbon future? And his response was, uh, was uh, pretty direct. And I'll quote, we see an essential path to prosperity for our clients and their communities, knowing that a sustainable planet goes hand in hand with a more efficient, productive, and ultimately profitable economy for everyone. So I'd like to talk to you this morning about RBC's view of environmental issues, particularly around carbon, and why we believe it's essential for Canada, for businesses, consumers, and community leaders to see the economy and environment as mutually dependent. Our message is quite simple. We won't meet our carbon emission targets without a vibrant, innovative, and efficient economy. And we won't develop or sustain that economy without reducing our carbon emissions. This is the economic challenge of the 21st century. To see the need to sustainably manage our energy resources, to see carbon reduction as a significant business opportunity, and to see both those ideas as the most realistic way for Canada to achieve, or for Canadians to achieve their potential and fulfill their aspirations in the decades ahead. This is our Apollo mission if we seize the moment it could be our Titanic if we don't. So first, the opportunity. Retrofitting the global economy 
could be the biggest economic project of our time, far bigger than the post-war reconstruction in the mid-20th century. As it stands now, the world is adding more capacity for renewable power each year than coal, natural gas, and oil combined. This fast-growing clean tech market is expected to exceed $2 trillion by 2020, bigger than Canada's GDP. Moreover, over the next 15 years, $90 trillion in new infrastructure investments will be required around the world to achieve a global low-carbon transition. $90 trillion. China alone could spend $30 trillion, a third of that, in transitioning to a lower carbon economy. Here at home, Canada's clean tech industry is already worth almost $12 billion and is increasingly important to our place in the global economy. In 2014, we exported $5.8 billion of sustainable technologies. Now to some notes of caution. Environmental disasters are already beginning to impact the global financial system. As Bank of, Can uh, Bank of Canada, pardon the, express, uh, the slip, Bank of England Governor Mark Carney has warned, the challenges currently posed by climate change pale in significance compared to uh, with what might come. The OECD projects that by 2060, 23 of 25 economic regions in their forecast models will suffer notable GDP losses stemming directly from climate change if we don't take action. In Canada, we're already seeing evidence of that. Payouts from extreme weather have more than doubled every five to 10 years since the 1980s. And in every year since 2010, insurers have paid out $1 billion in property damages. This year, just from the Fort McMurray fires, the financial toll will be a multiple of that, with insured losses expected to be between $5 billion and $10 billion. The enormous business questions that stem from climate change may seem a long way from our day-to-day -day businesses of mortgage lending, deposit taking, and credit cards. So let me give you a better sense of RBC's thinking and our business. For those of you who aren't familiar with RBC, we're Canada's largest uh, bank and among the top 20 banks in the world. We've been around for 147 years, have built a, tw a trillion dollar balance sheet, and last year generated $100 billion in revenue. A third of all Canadians do some form of business with us. Nearly 80,000 people around the world work with us. We've also been financing clean tech for decades, helping fuel the growth of this incredibly important sector. Here's one illustration. As of last October 31st, the end of our fiscal year, RBC Capital Markets had $3.4 billion in loan and trading line exposure in clean energy financing. In the US, we've invested just under $630 million in green affordable housing projects. We are a Canadian leader in the green bond market and active in similar markets all over the world. In 2015, RBC was involved in the underwriting of over $3 billion in green bonds. Since the inception of RBC's Carbon Trading Group in 2008, we have traded over 1 billion tons of carbon credits, more than any other financial institution in Canada. So as you can see, environmental issues are not a CSR issue at uh, RBC, they're core to our business. With extensive connections to the clean tech sector on both sides of the border and decades of, experiencing, of, of experience financing the sector's growth, my colleagues at RBC have developed an appreciation of the role that private and public capital need to play. And they appreciate the essential sense, uh, I'm sorry, the essential place in the, this ecosystem for predictable, transparent, and evidence-based policy that once implemented is protected from the whims and wishes of political intrusion. We've also learned the importance of learning, of knowing that we're all rel relatively new to this, and we all know or should know that the decades ahead will likely be more challenging than the decades behind us. Now, I suspect such a statement would receive near unanimous agreement in this room and probably be endorsed by most people now in Canadian Parliament. Our Canadian consensus may stop there. I know we Canadians, at least to those who are uh, just visiting, can come across as an agreeable bunch, perhaps divided only by our preference of hockey teams or debates about which side of the canoe we should paddle on. Uh, but don't believe it. We uh, Canadians are prone to intense national debates on all sorts of important issues. How we should respond to climate change continues to rank high among them. Last month, I attended the Liberal Party's biennial policy convention in Winnipeg and got a whiff of the mood at the opening plenary plenary, which was devoted to climate issues. The first speaker was a former Greenpeace director from Quebec who called for an immediate end to oil extraction and all pipelines, 
which he called morally and ethically indefensible. He received a vigorous standing ovation. I wasn't en entirely surprised, because if you go to Vancouver, you'll find a large part of the population, including the mayor, vehemently opposed to a proposed pipeline to carry oil to the city's harbor, where it would be loaded on ships for Asia. Or travel to Quebec, and you'll find another debate about the proposed Energy East pipeline, meant to carry oil from Alberta to the Atlantic coast. Last Friday evening, I attended another meeting, a public town hall in Midtown Toronto, which was also attended by our federal climate change minister, Catherine McKenna, who's traveling the country to hear how Canadians think we can best meet our Paris commitments. The audience was passionate, passionate about an end to pipelines, an end to the oil sands, an end to large houses, an end to oil powered cars, even an end to economic growth. Now, I don't want to suggest that these are the views of mainstream Canadians. They're not. Many, many polls tell us that. But the views of these vocal minorities need to be addressed directly, and I'd like to do that this morning. This isn't about having our cake and eating it too. It's about the realization that we need a new economic approach to restoring growth, and an approach that includes the sustainable use of oil and gas for the foreseeable future, and a longer-term bet on economic ingenuity, and clean innovation across every sector, including traditional energy. Canada is home to the third largest supply of oil, and we're the fifth largest producer of natural gas. We have a global responsibility to find cleaner and more efficient ways to extract, ship, and use these resources. World demand for energy, whether we like it or not, will grow probably 30% or more in the next quarter century. That demand should be met by those who can supply it at the lowest cost with the lowest amount of carbon used. Some of that will be met by renewables, but in our view, a full transition will take decades. In the meantime, Canada has the opportunity, and I'd argue the, uh, the obligation, to use our natural resources productively and sustainably to meet global demand, at the same time as we're scaling up our renewable industries. Our strategy could be similar to Norway's. That is, continue to produce oil as long as the world needs it, focus on producing it with, a low, with as low an environmental footprint as possible, and reinvest a significant part of the revenues to help accelerate our transition to a, glean, to a clean energy economy. The strength of such an approach is found in the importance of resources to our overall economy. Consider the following. Natural resources account for 20% of Canada's GDP and more than 50% of our exports. Energy contributes $17 billion on average to federal and provincial government revenues. Oil and gas makes up 20% of the Toronto Stock Exchange and roughly 7.5% of Canada's GDP. We are an energy nation. With all these resources below us, we should step up to the challenge in front of us. To do so, we need to find ways to finance and support the great carbon shift and the capital needed will have to come from the efficient extraction of the resources we now have. Much of the industry, to its credit, is already on that path. One example is Canada's Oil Sands Innovation Alliance, or COSIA, which is ramping up clean innovation by sharing environmental tech patents. This will help drive clean innovation. In other words, we need our traditional energy sector to help reinvent itself and to help grow Canada's new energy economy. And we need to bet on innovation, inspired by public research, driven by private enterprise, and financed by public and private capital to ensure that we can compete in a 21st century energy economy. Let's be clear, halting economic growth isn't the way to solve climate. What we need to focus on is carbon emissions. We need to decouple economic growth from the growing environmental impact so that we get more of the things we need like jobs, social programs, retirement savings, and much less of the things we don't want, like carbon pollution. As I've said, we will need investment, entrepreneurship, and innovation to develop the clean technologies to solve climate change. And these things will only happen if there is a market reward. And that reward is growth, good growth, clean growth. To foster such growth, we have to give the private sector a key role shaping our low carbon future because this isn't something governments can or should dictate. Making that transition will require entrepreneurs and inventors, equity and innovation. The federal government has made innovation and climate two of the most important pillars of its mandate. 
And those pillars are, of course, connected. Innovation has to be the key to curbing climate change. But innovation in and of itself isn't just a policy. It's a culture. Now, what do we know about that culture? Well, for one, innovation tends to thrive in ecosystems. And that requires clusters of knowledge, usually emanating from great centers of learning. They tend to need a steady diet. Those clusters tend to need a steady diet of risk capital, not just long-term money, but the wise, patient, and demanding investors that come with it. Such ecosystems tend to have an ability to commercialize the ideas that those investors want to underwrite, and to do so in markets that allow entrepreneurs to scale their operations to, a, to withstand to scale their operations to a size that can withstand the unforgiving cycles of an economy or mood swings of a market when it comes to technology. Most of all, these places tend to lay claim to awesome talent, to a critical mass of people who dream, dream big, work hard, play well with their intellectual neighbors, and defy rejection. With those qualities, Canada, indeed North America, should be poised to lead the world into a new age of cleaner economic activity. Without them, we may be doomed to pour countless billions down bureaucratic sinkholes. So where does Canada stand today on environmental innova innovation? Well, given the checklist I've just presented, we should be a global leader, a country that one might expect to create, say, the Uber of public transit, the Apple of energy storage, or the Google of green farming. Unfortunately, we're not. Truth be told, we're laggards. According to the Conference Board of Canada, we rank 13th among 16 peer countries in overall innovation rankings. The picture is worse when considering R&D. Canada ranks 22nd among OECD countries for business expenditure on R&D intensity, the second lowest in the G7. One cause for concern is our universities and colleges. Canada is blessed with several world-class post-secondary institutions which generate excellent research. Yet commercializing that research is a real challenge. Jim Balsilli, the co-founder of BlackBerry and now an investor in startups, wrote poignantly last year about the challenges and opportunities for research commercialization. He argued that the University of Toronto, as just one example, claims to be in a league with, Standard, uh, with Stanford and MIT, and yet pointed out Stanford generated $1.3 billion in royalties for itself in 2014. By contrast, U of T generates annual licensed IP income of less than $3 million, $1.3 billion to $3 million. Last year, MIT issued 288 US patents. By contrast, U of T averages eight US patents a year, less than 1% of what either Stanford or MIT does. As Balsilli says, universities need to be part of a wide, wider strategy to better teach and encourage the commercialization of ideas. We also have to address our talent gap. Canada takes in between 250,000 to 300,000 immigrants each year. And we have a strategic advantage over other countries in this regard. But dig into these immigration numbers and you can see there are problems for sectors such as clean tech that need significant intellectual horsepower. In 2012, Canada ranked 15th out of 33 countries in researchers for thousands employed in industry a big drop from seventh in 2006, according to the Science, Technology, and Innovation Council. To help reverse this, we need to make Canada a magnet for environmental talent and ambition, just as Silicon Valley is for entrepreneurs and coders. And that will require bold policy ideas, such as a new approach to professional class visas, permanent residency for international students, and tax incentives for entrepreneurs. Clean innovation on the scale we need is not going to happen magically on its own, of course. Canada will not develop and propagate the technologies needed to meet our climate targets without a clearer policy and regulatory framework. Partnership between the public and private sectors is essential. Perhaps even more critical will be a clear and consistent approach to carbon pricing. As Smart Pro Prosperity has articulated very well, we should put a cost on pollution and incentivize clean choices by way of flexible policies that stimulate innovation and leverage the revenue from carbon pricing to drive further economic and environmental benefits. The OECD has found that policies successfully driving innovation have three key traits. They are stringent, flexible, and predictable. We need to follow this advice. A smart carbon policy will ramp up the price over time, 
in a predictable way to send a clear signal that supports long-term investments in clean technologies that are key to shifting the economy. In our view at RBC, carbon should be priced at a level to create long-term behavioral change and to ensure polluters pay as we all move toward low carbon targets. But we also need smart and targeted complementary approaches, including flexible regulations and public investment. Many of the major technology innovations of the past century, let's remind ourselves, were achieved through a mix of public and private research. And there's no reason to think that won't continue in this century. The right policy framework will also be one that actively encourages and stimulates private sector invest investors. We should recognize that public investment, though critical to, vote, to, to growth, must be complemented by the liquidity and size of private capital. And we will need the right mix. Public policy and public investment have key roles to play in helping drive a transition to clean technologies. They just must be adapted in smart ways. In particular, any large scale clean tech policy should be transitional, aimed at filling gaps and leveraging private capital until market forces can take over. Smart public investments must be objective, risk tolerant, far-sighted, and based on deep expertise. That's why public investment must be done by arm's length and by expert bodies removed from day-to-day -day politics. We have a signal of how it can be done through Sustainable Development Technology Canada. Pension funds can also play a key role. These large pools of money seek clear returns in exchange for long-term in investments. This can help transcend the short-termism that unfortunately shapes much of our capital markets today. Likewise, we need the private sector to bring discipline and dynamism into the, our innovation ecosystem. Look at the management you see coming out of venture capitalists in Silicon Valley. Look at the vigorous activity they produce. This matters, especially at the early phases of any given startup. We need to encourage much more of that dynamism in Canada. If we want to build a vigorous innovation culture, we need to actively discourage the idea that the only way to tackle climate change is through less, less growth and less profit. We need the incentives and the opportunities to do more, to be more creative in how we grow and how we rise to the challenge of succeeding in a low carbon transition. It will require a concerted and sustained effort to constantly, constantly drive innovation and clean tech so we can maintain prosperity while reducing the damage we have caused the planet. At least we know from our Canadian experience, clean tech is highly creative and very adaptive. It creates net new products and services for everything from smart cars to smart buildings to smart cities. And it embraces what producers already do, be it in, oil and oil, in the oil sands or gas extraction or myriad other industrial uses by generating better products out of more efficient processes. Several clean tech companies in Canada have been very successful in this already. Let me share one example, Ecobee. It's a small Canadian firm competing well in certain markets with Google's Nest, providing smart Wi-Fi thermostats that can be activated through smartphones and by voices. Or take a look at Pond Technologies, which is working with oil sands giant Canadian Natural Resources Limited, or CNRL, on algae tech. CNRL believes such advances in biorefining could cut more than one and a half million tons of CO2 emissions, the equivalent of taking 300,000 vehicles off the road. I hope these examples show that clean tech can't exist in isolation. It is only widely adapted when it's part of cultural and market changes, driven by private sector players and consumers. We know, after several decades of experience, that you can't force new technologies on consumers. We all need to be coaxed and nudged and given a range of choices in a free market. Companies, for the most part, are also very good at responding to new norms set by shareholders, regulators, consumers, and employees. Perhaps this is one reason why Canadian oil and gas, oil and natural gas companies have invested more than $1.3 billion so far to develop and share more than 800 distinct technologies and innovations to reduce the industry's environmental impact on land, water, tailings, and GHGs. I mentioned Canada's Oil Sands Innovation Alliance a few minutes ago. Their members are sharing technologies to accelerate clean innovation. Now, as Shakespeare wrote in The Tempest, what's past is prologue, but it needn't be a perpetuation of what was wrong in the past. Today, 
this is one example, four of the top 10 renewable energy producers in Canada are traditional energy companies. The depth and breadth of Canada's energy sector is a remarkably strong foundation on which to build for the future. In addition to being world-class suppliers of traditional sources of energy, Canada excels in several areas with tremendous potential. Energy storage, for example, as well as alternative transportation fuels, home and building systems, automation, and advanced materials, such as high-strength polymers. In fact, Canada's stock exchanges host more clean tech companies than any other country in the world. These are areas of strength which we can add to through more private capital, more publicly funded research, and a more targeted talent strategy focused on immigration and education. For the policymakers here with us this morning, I hope you don't see clean tech as something that has been assigned to, to the environmental file, but rather view it as an essential element of an economic growth agenda. With that in mind, I'll close with five brief suggestions on how to fully leverage clean tech's ability to fuel innovation and combat climate change. First, we need to attract and grow equity capital for high-risk innovation. This is the money and associated brain power that can take a proven technology from pilot to commercialization. We already have an institution called BDC, or Business Development Bank of Canada, which has a good track record in managing such risk. BDC could be a home for more targeted financing tools focused primarily on the challenge of scaling up and commercializing clean technologies. Second, we need to give the private spe sector space to innovate within a flexible policy framework and let the market pick the technologies that will succeed. This could, could include tax incentives for angel investors and venture capital pools and regulatory allowances for financial institutions to invest more along the risk curve of clean tech. Third, we need to find ways to motivate mainstream Canadian companies to adopt clean technologies. Adoption of technologies is the Everest of, clean tech, of the clean tech industry. How can we create the right incentives for companies to play the long game? Fourth, government should revise tax incentives for R&D to get more new clean technologies into the pipeline and focus resources more, focus uh, public resources more on direct spending on research. This approach should, resolve, should revolve around clusters that bridge entrepreneurs and great centers of learning. And fifth, we need to ensure Canadians retain, we need to ensure Canada retains and attracts some of the best talent in the world when it comes to clean tech, environmental policy, and green markets. One step would be to ensure fast track visas for highly trained professionals needed by this strategic sector, which will increasingly need intellectual heft and entrepreneurial zeal as well as financial capital. Of course, as I stressed earlier, all of this will be effective only if it is developed in the context of a clear, consistent, and predictable approach to carbon pricing and ensuring other environmental regulations are based on independent evidence and expert oversight and adjudicated outside the bounds of the political arena. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for allowing me to share these thoughts with uh, you this morning. While we as a planet don't have an abundance of time, we do need to experiment. We need to learn from our successes and our failures and adjust as we go. And we need to harness our faith. We need to harness our faith in human ingenuity, in the vision and det determination of people like David Berliner. I'd like to leave you with the story of David, who is co-founder of a company called CoPower, a Canadian online lender focused on clean energy. David got the idea for his company about a decade ago when he was at the University of Toronto and discovered the campus could not retrofit its buildings because it lacked the basic financing tools to pay for it. So he started CoPower, and with the support of 100 investors, including the RBC Generator Fund, he's now aiming to finance $100 million of such retrofits over the next three years. One of them he's already done. It's at a social housing project outside of Toronto. The deal came to David when the agency involved discovered it needed to replace light bulbs to new LED, LED technology in 49 social housing uh, buildings, but it didn't have the funds to do so. Enter CoPower, which financed the project through the engineering firm that was hired to carry out the project. CoPower will get its money back in three years. As David told me, this isn't a technology challenge, it's a financing challenge. I believe CoPower combines everything we're discussing this morning. Public sector policy, 
private, uh, private capital, and human ingenuity in a winning formula. It's a made in Canada solution that's really made by Canada and might just be a hint of where the world can go. The power of markets, the transformative strength of technology, the passion of human enterprise, and the discipline of guidelines set by democratic governments. These are the elements of all sustainable innovation, and they're what we will need for the transformation ahead. This approach that we like to call smart prosperity is essential for the planet. It's among our best hopes for the economy, and done right, it's good for business. It's not a trade-off, as some would have us believe. It's a trade-up for all of us. Thank you all for listening, and good luck with the uh, rest of the conference.